If you would, turn in your Bibles to Exodus <clears throat> chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. As we consider this morning, Christ our Sabbath with a day to remember. If you haven't seen the movie Chariots of Fire, I would highly recommend you do so. In the 1924 Paris Olympics, Eric Liddell was a favored gold medal winner. He was known as the uh, Scotsman, the flying Scotsman. He was a Christian aspiring to be a missionary to China, but he had deep convictions regarding the fourth commandment. To his surprise, he found out that the trial heats would be held on Sunday for the 100-meter dash, and he refused to run. And this would be an embarrassment to both king and country, and so there were uh, powerful men that gathered around him one scene, and uh, the political leaders of the day, his coach, others that were important figures, they all put pressure on him to change his mind on his silly beliefs. He was challenged to prove his loyalty to both king and country. And his response was this, God made countries, God made kings, and the rules by which they govern, and those rules say the Sabbath is his, and I for one intend to keep it that way. And no pressure continued, though the pressure, I should say, continued, Liddell would not budge. And some would say to his conviction, it was nothing more than legalism, uh, it was bondage. To Liddell, it was obedience leading to freedom and joy. We've been dealing with the Ten Commandments, and we're on the fourth. And of the Ten Commandments, none is more controversial than this one. Some claim none of the commandments are valid for the New Covenant. Others, only nine are valid, but the fourth has been abolished. Many argue for a Lord's Day with no connection or, uh, to moral obligations to the fourth commandment. In other words, Sunday is fine, but there's no special day above another. Most find some level of fulfillment of the Sabbath in Christ. And so we would ask, where do we go with this commandment? The theme is God has appointed a holy day to point us to our eternal rest in Christ. And we'll be answering the question, is the fourth commandment totally fulfilled in Christ, or is there a continuing moral aspect of it that is binding on new covenant believers? Now, this topic may be new to some of you. It may be well rehearsed by others. But I trust that as we go into this topic, what I have to say will begin the conversation of this portion of God's sacred word rather than engender controversy. At the same time, I believe no Christian should rest till he has satisfactorily discovered the mind of God in this matter. And so my purpose is not to bind your conscience with my opinions, but hopefully go through the scriptures and see if they will frame your convictions. You may well be convinced of a position contrary to the one I present today, but I caution you not to do it lightly, but do it with spiritual warrant. If you're in the text, it says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." Jonathan Edwards saw a connection with worship in the first four of these commandments. The first command, he says, fixes the object. The second, the means. The third, the manner. And the fourth, the time. And so we'll look at the subject under four headings. Understanding the doctrine un unfolds by progressive revelation and often by good and necessary inferences. Inferences, I should say. We'll be moving from the beginnings of the Old Testament and gathering fragments that unfold more clearly in the New Testament. So, notice the first thing, the fourth commandment, from creation to Sinai. And there are three things as we move from creation to Mount Sinai regarding the Decalogue, or regarding the fourth commandment. The Sabbath day is grounded in creation. Two times we read holy in our text, and it sandwiches the commandment, emphasizing its importance. 
And notice the pattern of six days of work and one day of rest. Everyone and every creature was to rest. You see the words remember and six days and work and Sabbath and rested and seventh day. All of those words point us back to creation. Genesis 2 verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now many have attempted to discover the origins of a seven day week cycle and the best explanation is that it is rooted right here in the creation. The Sumerians or anyone else who used it before Israel's time learned it from this creation account. Creation is the reference point to the fourth commandment as well. God is sovereign over time and he can tell us when to rest and when to work. You notice in Genesis 2, God rested. He literally Sabbathed or was Sabbathing. The word means to cease and to be refreshed. Exodus 31, 17, on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. God does not grow weary. He looked about the creation with delight and with satisfaction and with joy, with peace and glory in his heart and he refreshed himself. As one said, it is a rest of achievement, not of inactivity. My father is working, said Jesus, until now. It's the seventh day. It's one day out of seven. Sabbath does not mean Saturday in Hebrew. The emphasis is on a seven-day cycle, six days of work, one day of rest, refreshment, delight. God made it holy. He sanctified it. He set it apart from what is ordinary or common, in this case, the other six days. And notice, most importantly, God blessed it. Don't miss that. There's a blessing in the day that God rested on. The seventh day was a sign of God's grace. Breaking the Sabbath was a rejection of the God of creation, which in fact meant a denial of God's covenant grace. Two times in Genesis, that text in Genesis, the word finished gives us a redemptive hint. God finished his work has an echo in the New Testament cry of Christ from the cross. It is finished as Jesus finished his redemptive work. And then the seventh day was the only day not to have morning and evening attached to it. There's a hint of perpetuity of the day with implications for this life and the life to come, for the new covenant as well as our eternal rest in heaven. The second thing we notice is God made the day for the benefit of all mankind, not just the Jews. Jesus said the Sabbath was made or it was created for man. And he echoes the creation account. He didn't say it was made for the Jews. He used the broadest Greek term that he could use for humanity or mankind. Our passage says even the Gentile or the sojourner within your gates, a Gentile temporarily dwelling within the gates of Israel was also to rest on the Sabbath. This is a commandment that was binding upon them as well as the Jews. It's not Moses' commandment. It's not Israel's commandment. It's a commandment that was made and created for the benefit and the good of mankind. But then notice, third of all, the day was practiced before Sinai. Adam knew this law. God did not bless and make the day holy for himself, but for Adam's race. More laws were in place in the garden long before the Ten Commandments were given in stone at Mount Sinai. Murder and adultery were already violations of God's law. Adam, as an image bearer of God, would have heard and imitated this pattern of six days of working and resting on the seventh day that was made for man. And you get a hint of that with Cain and Abel long before there were Jews. It seems they were aware of this command. They both came to worship at the same time before God with their offering. Genesis 4, 3 and 4, and I have all of these texts printed in that larger outline before you. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and then Abel brought his offering. You know the story. God was pleased with 
Abel's, but not with Cain's. But that phrase, in the course of time, literally reads in the Hebrew, at the end of days. One translation says, at the designated time. It is by good and necessary inference, I believe, that they knew that the end of days or the designated time was at the end of the six-day work cycle. God had already put in motion not only the required type of sacrifice for worship, but apparently, according to some, a specific day of worship, the last day in the seven-day cycle. This command was in play before Mount Sinai in Exodus 16. Israel in the wilderness was to gather manna on six days, but they were forbidden to gather it on the Sabbath. And this was long before the giving of the Ten Commandments, or at least it was, I don't know, maybe a month or more. But the language is so precise that we can draw a necessary inference. Exodus 16, 23, in, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. And so the Israelites already knew about this commandment before the giving of the law at Sinai. Exodus 16, 29 through 30, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. They were to remember and practice what God had already revealed. And so I'm submitting to you that because the Sabbath is grounded in the creation narrative long before the Decalogue was given, it functions as a moral command like fruitfulness in bearing children, Genesis 1.28 or the institution of work, Genesis 2.15, or of marriage, Genesis 2.24 and 25. We're firm on the things that we believe about these things because from the beginning God said it was so. Pastor Richard Barcellus notes this. When the Bible looks back to creation and draws ethical principles from it, those principles are normative for all men at all times under all circumstances. In other words, he says, the creation account contains principles that function as moral law. They are not relative to covenant or culture, but transcend both. And we would say that about marriage. We would say that about work. We are saying the same about this seventh day. Now, through Moses, they were being given the familiar commandments in codified form. This harkens back to creation. But then we move to the second point, the fourth commandment from Sinai to Calvary. And I want you to notice here six things. First, the tablets imply permanence. These 10 words alone were written on tablets of stone. All as a unit, all ten commandments. All ten commandments were written by the finger of God, Exodus 31, 18, Deuteronomy 9, 10. All the other words were given to Moses most like, uh, verbally and most likely written on animal skins. The tablets were written, the words on the tablets were written by the finger, the very finger of God. The tablets as a unit were to be placed in the Ark of the Covenant, implying the abiding nature of the Decalogue. Jeremiah 31 predicts in the new covenant day that the law would be written on the believer's heart, on every single believer's heart. And the Apostle Paul reflects this in the, to the Corinthians when he says in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone referring to the Decalogue, but on tablets of human hearts. And the implication there is, be, is that the tablets of stone were now permanently embedded, or at least the law on the stones were embedded in the hearts of the New Covenant Christian. But then we notice, second of all under this heading, the day is also rooted in redemption. In Deuteronomy 5, the Ten Commandments were given a second time. They were repeated once Israel crossed over Jordan. And there's really nothing new in that repeating of the commandments. 
Practically everything is the same as before and hearken back to creation. But now there's a greater emphasis on redemption. The overarching theme and the prologue to the first giving of the Ten Commandments, if you remember when Pastor Luke preached way back a few weeks ago, the prologue said in Exodus 5, uh, uh, 6 is exactly the same as what we read in Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, in the Exodus 20 account is exactly the same as we read in Deuteronomy 5, 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The same thing, but it's exemplified, it's, it's expanded here. He goes on to say in Deuteronomy 5.15, God wants this redemptive theme to be magnified. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And so it harkens back to creation, but the redemptive aspect where it was a whisper in creation at that ordinance then emphasizing it is finished, now it is, it is expanded and magnified and emphasized in a greater way. They must never forget that resting and worship on the seventh day is not only rooted in the creation order, but also in their deliverance from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And not only because of the creation order, but also because of their redemption were God's people to rest then on this seventh day. The celebration of creation and redemption will play a role as we go to the new covenant and see how it coincides with Christ in the gospel age. But then under the second point, third of all, the redemption theme is further amplified, amplified in Joshua's Canaan conquest. If you remember, upon entering the promised land, when Joshua's people completed their march around Jericho for the seventh time, it was on the seventh day the walls came tumbling down. That's when the people entered their rest in Canaan. And according to Hebrews 3 and 4, which we read earlier, chapter 4 of Hebrews, Canaan is a shadow of the people of God entering into a redemptive Sabbath rest in the new creation. And then fourth of all, Isaiah's prophetic utterance looks to the new covenant age of Gentiles keeping the Sabbath. Isaiah speaks of the coming Messiah through the servant songs, Isaiah 40 through 45. And then Isaiah 56 through 66, we read of the new covenant gospel messianic age culminating in the new heavens and in the new earth. And Isaiah 56 informs us that foreigners or Gentiles and eunuchs would be recipients of the new covenant in that gospel age. According to Deuteronomy 23.1, no eunuch was allowed to enter the congregation of the Lord. But Isaiah 56 addresses eunuchs in the new covenant being blessed for keeping the Sabbath in the house of prayer for all peoples. Do you think it was a coincidence that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading from the prophet Isaiah when Philip met him? He was part of the prophetic word in Isaiah 56, becoming the first Gentile that we know of gathered into the new Israel. Sabbath keeping was predicted right along with Gentile inclusion in the new covenant. And then fifth of all, Jesus' commentary on the day. Jesus came to fulfill, not abolish the moral law. You don't fulfill something by getting rid of it. Jesus confirms the Sabbath when he says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 8. Jesus speaks at least 11 times on the subject of the Sabbath. If the Sabbath as a special day to observe has no more, more moral implications, you would expect him to abolish the commandment. But instead we hear him over and over and over again making corrections to the Jewish leaders for their additions and for their misuse and for their abuses, their severe abuses of the Sabbath. Jesus said, For you load people with burdens hard to bear. The Sabbath was never meant to be practiced the way the Pharisees practiced it. Rules upon rules upon rules. And then sixth of all, the Sabbath as a covenant signed to Israel is fulfilled in the new covenant Israel, Christ in the church. 
That terminology may be new to some of you, and it would take time to develop, but suffice it to say that Jesus is the true vine. He became the new Israel, and the church being in union with him is also called the Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16. And covenant signs such as circumcision and the Passover have become ac applicable to the new covenant Israel. We now have circumcision of the heart and the new birth. We celebrate the Lord's Supper rather than the Passover. And likewise, this covenant sign of the Sabbath has new covenant implications as a sign to the new Israel. And it obviously points our, to our Sabbath rest in Christ. We have sung about that. Jesus, I am resting, resting in you. But the question remains, is there still a day to remember? Is there an echo of the fourth commandment for new covenant believers? We don't hear that stealing or adultery or murder were only binding on Israel through the covenant. And so we have to ask the question, why would we have nine commandments and not ten? Is the Decalogue a unit or can we drop one and nine? Well, then third of all, notice our third major point, the fourth commandment from the seventh day to the first day or the Lord's day. You remember our big idea has been as God has appointed a holy day to point us to our eternal rest in Christ, answering the question, is the fourth commandment totally fulfilled in Christ or is there a continuing moral aspect of it that is binding on new covenant believers? And so under this heading, we, we consider five things. Now, you're going to have to stretch. I know you've had a lot of Christmas. You've had a lot of New Year's. And we have the first Lord's Day from the new year of 2022. And so, but we're going to stretch your mind a little bit. So buckle up, all right? The Old Covenant Sabbath has been fulfilled, first of all, in Christ and given a new day. I would remind you that the day was not named in the creation account. The day is what we call positive law. We've already taught on that. Luke's sermon mentioned positive law as being laws that were temporarily in place for a time. Circumcision, the Passover, would be positive laws. They point to a greater truth in the new covenant. They become signs with new meaning, but no longer binding in the same way. The one in seven is to be kept. The day may change. It may change from the old covenant to the new. Since we're no longer under the old covenant, the positive or circumstantial practices associated with the day are no longer applicable. All the shadows are done away with and are fulfilled in Christ. And this is what Paul was arguing against in those passages in Romans and Colossians and Galatians that says away with all these festivals and all these days, special days and Sabbaths, Sabbaths there is plural. It's not regard, referring to the day, but there were other Sabbaths and festivals and special days. And they were not to lay these on the Gentiles as part of their justification. We now have the liberty not to pay attention to ceremonies and special foods, Romans 14, or attempting to return to Judaism for justification, Galatians 4, but not the elimination of a creation mandate or the moral aspect of the fourth commandment in the Decalogue any more than you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and so forth. When Paul cited the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6, 2, honor your father and mother, he added, this is the first commandment with a promise. The assumption being that the fifth commandment was in a sequence after the first four. And the one prior to the fifth is the fourth. And New Covenant believers are not worshiping according to the Jewish Sabbath on the seventh day. We're not under the Old Covenant practices. But I would submit the fourth commandment belongs to a unit of ten. It retains a permanent moral obligation just like the other nine. But the day can change with no violation to the moral aspect of the commandment. So what's the basis of the first day? What's the basis of this 
first day. It's still creation and redemption. That's second of all under this heading. The new creation and our redemption was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. Jesus cried, it is finished. And that reaches back to the finished work of creation. On the cross, Jesus accomplished all that the prophets had foretold about redemption and a new creation. And by this work, he delivered us from sin and from death and from judgment. And we cannot work for our salvation. We must rest in him. We're new creations in him and redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And that work was finished. Jesus had another step in the process of the new creation, though, and, the, and, and in redemption. He still had to rise from the dead. Ephesians 2.15, that he might create a new man. And so the resurrection points to both redemption and a new creation or a recreation. And the new creation and our redemption was begun at, by Jesus at the cross and confirmed in the resurrection on the first day of the week, not Saturday. That was the day he was Sabbathing in the tomb. But on the first day or the eighth day, a new day would be based on the resurrection of Christ. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day, which memorialized our redemption and our new creation in him. And then third of all, the pattern for meeting on the first day was set by the resurrection. I put several scriptures in your outline. We cannot look at all of those scriptures, but just a few. Consider the post-resurrection appearances of Christ on the first day. He appeared to Mary. John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. It was on the first day of the week. Luke 24, 13 tells us Jesus' meeting with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus was on that same day, the first day of the week. To the assembled disciples, John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And so from his first appearance to the next, it was one full week. And John makes a point to inform us that Jesus' next appearance was According to John 20, verse 26, eight days later, in other words, the first day of the week, it says his disciples were inside again and Jesus came and met with them. For one whole week, we hear nothing about Jesus until he appears again to his gathered disciples on the first day. And this is a pattern being set for meeting on the first day of the week. Puritan Matthew Poole says it was natural that the apostles should observe this day, but not probable that they would do it without the sanction of the Lord Jesus. And then consider the day of Pentecost the, on Acts, in Acts 2.1, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to his assembled church was poured out on the day of Pentecost on the first day, the, with the normal day to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Fifty days after the resurrection, Leviticus 23, 15 to 16 points us to the, the day of Pentecost after Passover, and it was on, in this case, the first day. Then there's the practice of the early church, both Jews and Gentiles, was to hold corporate meetings for worship on the first day of the week, and they recognized the sabbatical weekly sequence of times. Consider Paul when he was traveling through Greece with Luke, they were there for seven days, and Acts 20, verse 7 says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, and Paul talked to them. He talked to them, all right. Eutychus, that young man, was in the window, and he fell asleep. It says in Acts 20, verse 9, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. After that Paul was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost, yet he waited a whole week to meet with the brethren at Troas on the first day of the week, purposely. And then notice he instructs the Corinthians to take their offerings on the first day of the week, a pattern apparently already set in the churches. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, 
So the churches of Galatia were already directed to do this. So you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Now, it's odd that Paul said to the Colossians they weren't to give distinction to days, but he points to a specific day, the first day for the offering. They were not to observe Jewish days. They were to observe this first day, and it was taken for granted that the first day was the official replacement for the seventh day of the Old Covenant. These patterns speak loudly through good and necessary inference, and I believe through progressive revelation and other hermeneutical principles bring us to this conclusion. But then, fourth, Christ our heavenly Sabbath is commemorated by an earthly day of remembrance. Hebrews 4, verses 8 and 9. If you have that long text before you in that outline, you notice Hebrews 3, 7 through chapter 4, verse 13 is all a unit talking about a Sabbath rest. And the context makes it obvious that the Sabbath is typical of our present redemptive rest in Christ, but ultimately it's pointing us to our final eternal rest in the new heavens and the new earth. We find our Sabbath rest in him. Jesus promised the, to the weary, I will give you rest, Matthew 11. And the Hebrew writer picks up on that theme, connecting it to our eternal rest in Christ and he connects it also to the seventh day, Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4. His works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. This is the gospel, resting in the finished work of Christ. It has its ultimate fulfillment in that eternal rest, and the absence of evening and morning on the seventh day speaks volumes, I believe, of a perpetual, eternal, heavenly rest in Christ. And we should rejoice that we have this present rest in Christ and we're guaranteed an eternal rest in him that will never end. But it, that text comes in the context of a warning. Don't be like those Hebrews who did not enter that rest in Canaan, which is a picture of our eternal rest. If you're sitting here today and you're outside of Christ or you're living a lazy, uh, apathetic, neglect to your soul Christian life, you need a, this warning is to you. You need to perk up and listen because not all of those Israelites entered into that Sabbath rest or that eternal or that Canaan rest. And the Hebrew writer is saying this is a warning to you. Press on, press on, press on. Don't take your salvation for granted, but persevere in the faith. And many who received the good news failed, as we said, to enter that rest because of their unbelief. And that's the context. But notice in verses 8 and 9 of Hebrews 4, a particular day remains as a reminder. The Sabbath is a foretaste and a sign of eternal rest that points to our to the, the rest that we have presently that points to our eternal rest, but it does not eliminate the day in the meantime. Look at verses 8 and 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In this long narrative in chapter 3 through chapter 4, the Greek the, the author uses the Greek word for rest 11 times, including verse 8. In verse 8, he also said he spoke, God spoke of another day that would come later on. And that day points to verse 9 where he says there remains a Sabbath rest. What we don't notice in English is he switches to a completely different word than those other 11 words for rest. At times he used the word rest. Verse 9, Sabbath rest is one word. It means a keeping of a Sabbath as a practice. It's only used once here in the New Testament. But the verb form is used in the Old Testament Hebrew and Greek versions of the, of the Bible where it describes the activity of Sabbath 
keeping. Our text here says there remains, means it in the present, and notice it remains for the people of God. We possess something now. There is a Sabbath keeping that points to that rest, and not only now, but all into the future of that eternal rest to come. Eleven times in this entire discourse, before and after our rare word, the writer has been consistently using the same Greek word for rest, a common word describing our redemptive rest in Christ, but ultimately points to that eternal future rest that remains for the people of God. Now I have to ask, why does he all of a sudden insert this unique word for rest, which means the activity of Sabbath day keeping in all of its Old Testament and the Septuagint Greek version of the Old Testament. It means a Sabbath keeping, a day that God said in our text would come later on for the people of God. Later on from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Well, I submit to you the words of Dr. Joseph Piper. The uniqueness of the word suggests a deliberate theological purpose. He selects or, co or coins sabbatismos because in addition to referring to spiritual rest, it suggests as well an observance of that rest by a Sabbath keeping. Because the promised rest lies ahead for the new covenant people, they are to strive to enter the future rest, yet as they do so, they anticipate it by continuing to keep the Sabbath. The implication of this word doesn't void the meaning of an eternal rest, but the author wants us to know there still is a commemorative day of Sabbath keeping. Just as the Old Testament command began with remember, we have a weekly day to remind us of our eternal rest in Christ. Just like baptism and the Lord's Supper remind us of Christ's death and resurrection, new creation and redemption, that one day in seven sets our minds upon remembrance of our rest in Christ. And besides pointing to our spiritual rest, the Hebrew suggests a marker for that rest. In other words, an actual day of rest, a commemorative day. The inward reality does not void the external sign. And what is that day? Well, the Apostle John, in those familiar words, the same John that recorded two or three times about the Lord's appearing on the first day, says in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on what day? On the Lord's day. John uses a rare word for Lord here as well, used only here and once in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, where it refers to the Lord's Supper. It's a special word that is used of ownership, an owner of a master or of a slave. In secular Greek, Greek, Greek it meant owning, or, I'm sorry, belonging to an emperor. And in those two New Testament uses, John's use of it and Paul's use of it to the Corinthians, it means belonging to the Lord Christ. It points to ownership and possession and authority over the day. The language of ownership of the day should be familiar to these readers in John's day. Jesus declared that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. He was echoing the terms used by the prophet Isaiah when God referred to the Sabbath as my holy day and the holy day of the Lord, Isaiah 58, 13. Sixteen times in the Old Testament, God claims ownership of the day as my Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and John says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In his late use of the term, 96 A.D., in writing to this well-established group of seven churches, assumes they were already familiar with the Lord's day. And John's use of this term is significant since all of the gospel writers, he notes, of all of them, he notes that the resurrection was on the first day. And he also notes two appearances of the Lord on the first day. 
And now he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the day belonging to the Lord. And which day do you think John means belongs to the Lord? Well, it's not a coincidence. Was the first day just the most convenient day? You may not agree, but I would submit to you that the Lord's day, the first day, carries the moral significance of the fourth commandment. And it's been noted that in the Lord's Supper, we have the commemoration, commemoration of the Lord's death. On the Lord's day, we celebrate the commemoration of Christ's resurrection and our redemption. The day finalized a new creation over the new creation that exists within us because of his finished work. Well, I realize that was a lot to digest. I'm going to give you some practical implications at this last point. I won't take very long here, but the fourth point is the practical new covenant implications. How do we apply this to our Christian lives? You've been waiting for this. And here's where it gets problematic for many folks. Some people are crying legalism, Judaism, bondage. Or you may be asking questions like, can I watch football? Can I go jogging? Can I mow my lawn? Can I go to a restaurant? Can I ride my bike? Can I watch TV? Do I have to come to evening service? I would submit to you, perhaps you're asking the wrong questions. These are the kinds of questions the Pharisees asked, and that's why they had this long rule book. <laughs> the commandment simply said, cease from labor, set it apart as holy. It's a day of worship, and they made rules upon rules, so they thought they would be more holy. God set it apart to be holy, but he did not want bondage. He wanted freedom and liberty. And the question should be, how can I get the most spiritual good out of this day? How can I delight in the Lord on this day? How can I get the promised blessing from the Lord's day? And so here are some helpful questions to ask yourself. And I went into much more detail when I taught on the confession, if you want to refer to those online. This is going to be very brief, but what is a day, first of all? Ask this question, what is a day? Well, John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In a Greco-Roman world, that Greek word meant about 12 hours ranging from sun, uh, rise to sunset. Doesn't mean we're looking out the window waiting for the sun to rise and then to set and we're bound by those exact moments. We're not measuring exactly 12 hours, but this is a good new covenant barometer. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What is a day? If you told me you went to work yesterday and you were at work a day and told me you were only there for three hours and that was a day's work, I would question you. Is that really a day? John said he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and that had meaning. Who owns the day? The second question. We've established the fact that it belongs to the Lord. It's the Lord's day. It belongs to him. If you were to take everything I've said so far out of this lesson and focus on these two things, you would be well on your way. It is a day, and it is, with a definite article, the Lord's day. He owns the day. Third of all, how do I observe the day? As I said, the confession teachings gave more specifics, but you can go back and listen to those if you like. But Isaiah, in the passage that we read, Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14, help us, I believe, apply this text. Listen carefully. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly. You contrast there my holy day with your pleasure, my holy day with your own ways. But the key to that text in Isaiah is call the day a delight. It's an external sign of an internal rest. It was given for the benefit and delight of mankind, not for his demise or burden. Marriage between a man and a woman is good for all mankind. 
And the Lord's Day likewise has a blessing attached to it. It's a day to cease from common labor and activities and refresh ourselves in the Lord, to celebrate your liberation. It's not a burden, but a delight. It's not legalism, but a blessing. Jesus said, for this is, the, or John said, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not heavy to bear. They're not grievous. They're not oppressive. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is marriage a legalistic burden? Loving your wife, submitting to your husband? All of us that are married would admit it can be challenging at times, especially if it's a difficult marriage with no biblical grounds for divorce. But it's designed for our good and for our delight and for our blessing. Is work a legalistic burden? It can be difficult working by the sweat of your brow amidst the thorns and the thistles, but is legalism... Is it legalism to be told if you don't work, you don't eat? That's what the Apostle Paul said. Rearing children and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord has its challenges, especially when your kids don't give one whit about your God and your religion. But considering all the challenges, would anyone say that marriage and work and children are not filled with blessings? Why would we look at a day where we get to focus our attention on the Lord Jesus like no other day of the week, which allows us and affords us that, that delight and that pleasure? Why would we call it legalism or a burden or a drudgery or a bondage or stifling our freedom? You have to wrestle with those questions. Amos chastised the Jews because they couldn't wait for the Sabbath to end so they could get back to business and make more money. Instead, the Puritans nicknamed the Lord's Day as the market day of the soul. It was like going to a farmer's market and partaking in all the delights being offered, anything that would nourish the soul. We opened up worship with the reading from Sa uh, Sa Sabbath psalm, psalm that was filled with praise and with, with words of delight and joy. Did it sound like those people were singing with gloom and doom in their hearts? It's a day of worship. Jesus went to the synagogue before the pattern was set of the first day. Certainly, if it's the Lord's Day, assembling together with believers for worship ought to be a top priority. Spending time in the Word and prayer for yourself and your family and your Christian community. And you certainly have liberty, but liberty must not be overruled by what's expedient. Liberty must be constrained by the Word of God. Just because you have the freedom to do something does not mean it's helpful in every case. Former pastor once said, more rests upon motive and intent than upon the outward acts we do on Sunday. This is what the Pharisees got wrong, and Jesus wasn't breaking the Sabbath by gathering grain with his disciples. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath by healing on that day. Doctors and nurses and first responders do works of mercy and necessity. If you have a flat tire on Sunday, fix it. Get your ox out of the ditch. Well, then finally, what are the benefits? If you call the Sabbath a delight... Isaiah 58, 14, Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. To a Jew, this language was filled with the utmost of blessings. You delight in the day when you shall take delight in the Lord. You will ride on the high places of the earth. You will be well fed, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And one day, this down payment, this earthly day of rest will culminate in that eternal state in glory. And there our earthly labors among the thistles and the thorns will cease. And there will no longer be six days of sweat by our brow. Jesus has made the way for the new heavens and the new earth. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. But meanwhile, as we anticipate the heavenly state, we enjoy the crown jewel of the week, the best of all days, 
the Lord's day. As we sing John Newton's hymn, Safely Through Another Week, God has brought us on our way. Let us now a blessing seek, waiting in his courts today. Day of all the week, the best emblem of eternal rest. Eric Liddell was committed to becoming a missionary to China, and he did so. His sister thought his running was a waste of good time. He should be preparing for the mission field. He had a passion for running. And one day he surprised his sister that he was accepted for the mission to China, and she was exhilarated. But then he said, but I've got a lot of running to do first. I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. He said, it's not just fun to win is to honor him. That's how he looked at his running. And with all of that passion for running, <clears throat> he found a greater pleasure in the Lord and the Lord's day. And that Sunday when the practice heats were being run, the ones that he should have qualified for to win the gold, he was preaching in a local church. He preached from Isaiah 40 and he found his greatest pleasure to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I'm finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we have labored through several texts. We know that there are good and godly men who would disagree with this presentation this morning. We pray that we will not engender controversy, but instead find this an open conversation. What we want most of all is not more bondage, but we want the freedom to enjoy and delight in our Lord. And though, Father, it seems that you have given a day in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, to do just that. Help us to find our way through the um, different teachings on this subject and come to rest, but especially to be resting in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who is our true and blessed Sabbath rest.